For over 20 years, northern Uganda has been terrorised by civil war between President Museveni's government soldiers and the Lord's Resistance Army, led by Joseph Kony, a fanatic apparently possessed by a spirit demanding he overthrow the government and lead the country according to the biblical Ten Commandments. The deep spiritual nature of the Ugandan people enabled him to not only gain a following, but also influence them to carry out his will in unbelievably brutal ways. Government efforts to contain Kony failed to protect the population from widespread abduction, slavery, torture and murder. I lost my sister, I lost my brothers, and in the family all, it is only me who left. My father was killed by a rebel. My father was killed by the LRA, local resistance army. As a security measure, 85% of the population were herded into designated areas which became internal displacement camps. Here, disease and poverty took over the killing. The United Nations described the IDP camps in no uncertain terms. Totally unacceptable living conditions. The world's biggest and most neglected humanitarian disaster. Only around a quarter of the population got anything close to the World Health Organization's minimum water requirement. The whole purpose of these camps was to protect people from the rebel army. The most viciously targeted individuals were children, old and strong enough to carry an AK-47, but young enough to be scared witless and indoctrinated into Kony's LRA. A secondary school maths teacher gives us an insight into her pupils. Actually, we have uh, up to about 228 here, but when you look at their statistics, more than half of them have been to the bush, have been abducted. The girls have been taken as wives to the commanders, some of them even among themselves. The boys have been taken and uh, incorporated in the system as uh, child soldiers. And uh, actually, there are those who are abducted right from their homes, from their own families where they live. They were forced to even kill their own parents. They were forced to kill their own relatives, brothers and sisters, before they were taken away. Because in most cases what they want is uh, at least these energetic boys and girls. So when you're old or you may be too young, they want to leave you there. They want to give you a rest. And usually when they speak about rest, it means killing. Yes, I was a soldier and we were forced to fight. If you are forced to go and fight, or you are forced to go and kill somebody, what you are going to do, you better cry. You better cry. You just keep on crying. But that cannot happen when you are just abducted. I was beaten a stroke. 1,400 1, stick. Seriously. In your back here. So, I was beaten seriously. So. You will just allow everything to happen if somebody do that to you. And that uh, they have to, 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 to cut. And you know how much pain it enters before it cuts somebody to, to, to death. It is not easy. Some have to use even knives to stab their own parents. There are others you would, uh, be, you would be told to push into a hut your own family members and then set fire on those huts. And uh, you see them burn, you hear them cry, but there is nothing you can do about it. So resist the LRA and you die, but comply and you become the murdering rebel that the government's army must kill to protect the people. I got blindness, as you can see, my eyes. An aeroplane attacked us, putting and throwing so many bombs. Really, people died, people perished, and me, what happened was the smoke from this bomb got into my eyes. I would not see anything except see something white. When the rescue team came, I was the only one who was found alive. 
and I had hidden under a rock. That's why the bomb did not get me. That time, there was nothing they could do for me. There was no first aid to even give me. What they decided to do was to say, for you, you are now a little bit old. We are going to give you to one of the commanders. So they gave me to be the wife of one of the com commanders. Increasing numbers of abducted children are daring to risk escape from the LRA. I remember one sad moment when I wanted to escape. We were about four girls. But for me, I was pretending as if I didn't want to, to escape from their captivity. I got a jerry can. I was traveling as if I was going to fetch water. But incidentally, they found us again. The other ladies did not have anything. They are looking as if they wanted to escape. All these girls were shot dead and they were all killed. Because I had a jerry can, I told them Mia was going to fetch water. So they left me and that's how I survived. Those who do escape with their lives return nervously to a remarkably forgiving community. You come back from the bush, you want to join a family, they are nowhere to be seen. So it's, it's not easy for them. Most of them really feel shy about talking, uh, uh, and talking about their problems so, so much. They feel it's, it's really their own problem. It is theirs and uh, they don't easily talk about it. They don't expose it. And uh, given the situation that they have been living in, they have been traumatized. In their minds, there is that fear. They think their problems will be exploited. It will be misused, misinterpreted. Changing of that attitude from this other one, from being shooting to writing, is quite difficult. But the teachers have the challenge of doing that. And uh, you have to bring this child, and of course as a teacher you first have to make that child a friend. And bringing close a person that you really know has killed and his own parents, it's not very easy. These marginalised kids have been given a glimmer of hope in the last two years, as the violence has subsided and the prospect of peace comes closer. He'd come and steal all the kids from school, so then of course the kids got scared of going to school. And then we the parents got scared of sending our kids to school. And we all had to, to move away from the schools and during that Kony time for almost 20 years there was no schooling. It seems to have got better over the last couple of years and the kids are starting to go back to school again. We're really happy that you've come here to try and help us because now when we look at our children we can see that maybe the wind has got behind them a little bit and the wind is starting to push our children forward so we can see some hope for the future. The enlightened attitude of northern Uganda's Acholi people goes beyond a justice system based around peace and reconciliation and puts education squarely at the top of the list of every child's needs, right alongside food and water. They know that a peaceful, sustainable future will depend on their young growing up with the knowledge and wisdom to protect themselves from the evils of poverty, disease and rogue spirits. But schooling remains a luxury for impoverished families. Prosperous families lost everything overnight as they were herded into the IDP camps. Some people have been living in IDP camps for over a decade. Some are luckier and have moved out to improved accommodation and better conditions such as seen here. But it's often far from their original village, where they still find that their former property is destroyed, their land mined, and all nearby community resources closed. Schools are still displaced to safer sites often miles from their origin. Even if family units still exist, it's hard for them to find places where they can live, earn money and be near schooling. Yet, the determination to study remains. They have a lot of problems of payment of school dues. The, the school must run. As a headmaster, my interest is that the money is there and the school can run. Now, if you allow very many students to stay and then nobody is paying for them, you are, you are actually killing the school. Normally you should be at school and all the other children are at school and you're sitting here at home, why? 
because I did not pay it 1,000 for examination and I did not pay the school uniform, so why I am at home. So it becomes impossible to help a child who cannot pay this money because if you don't pay, the charges should be levied on the school where the school would not be able to get the money to pay. People will ask you why you are keeping them when they have not paid. The students, the teachers will ask you for their salary. Sure. How, what will you do? Yeah, the, the, the people who have supplied beans or posho may want the money. Now what do you do now? So let the child now be at home, do uh, homework like digging and any other thing. That is the way they, there is a lot of drop out because of problems and poverty that the parents have. With that uniform comes often for the first time in their lives a sense of order, belonging, love and hope, as well as often their only meal of the day. I'm actually eating at school once a day. When I eat during lunch time, in the evening for supper, I don't eat. I just sleep like that and I have to wait until tomorrow during lunch time then I eat. You know, in the villages, the, the parents cannot afford some nutritious feeding. So this is a child who still feels very weak. And this is a child who does not learn. This is a child who doesn't concentrate in the, school, in the class activities. It's quite difficult for a teacher to gradually bring that child to a level of a learner. If you're angry, revision will become very difficult. In our society, a weekly visit to a coffee shop is hardly life-changing. But a northern Ugandan child handed the price of a cappuccino is faced with an important choice. To buy shoes, a new water carrier, mere food, a blanket. In most cases, though, they'll hand it to a school and ask, can I please join in? And for that coffee money, they'll get a whole week's education. Sponsoring a child through their education with Educid costs less than a packet of crisps a day. That covers their school, and exam fees, and uniform, and a daily meal. Only beans, but it's often the only meal they will get. Every day. Every day, Maragwe? Yeah, every uh, day. No more talking? No more talking. Oh, and no cuckoo? Cuckoo? Chicken. Eh, no chicken. Just Maragwe. Eh, every day, beans. Every day, beans. Fifteen pounds a month covers it all and nothing else. No educated salaries, no advertising budget, filming expenses, no fundraising costs. With Educid, 100% of your sponsorship money is channeled directly into a child's education. Imagine making this choice, whether to hand a child a bag of crisps or give them a day's education.